I wanted this to be a holy place for monastics. The monastic life officially began on the property in the early 1930s. It began at a time when the church was under ferocious persecution by the communists. In the words of Professor Ivan Andreev, the reality of life in the Soviet Union is a nightmare that can be neither understood nor believed by those who have not experienced it. Already this area here near the convent had become home to at least 12 families who had escaped from the communist yoke in the early 1920s. These refugees passed their first winters living in dugouts made from mud and poplar sticks. It was for these hard-working and devout people that had brought their faith with them to the new land that the Archbishop Yosef, a great missionary and man of prayer, came to Bluffton. In the year 1935, a pious man by the name of Mikhail Mikhailov donated three acres of land to Archbishop Yosef. On this land, Archbishop Yosef established a small men's monastery which he had registered by the name of the Intercession of St. Mary. In 1937, the Archbishop, by the sweat of his brow, together with local immigrants, constructed a beautiful log church for the use of the community. In 1946, the Archbishop purchased the entire piece of property on which the present-day convent is now located. To our most respected, deeply respected and dearest Father in Christ, your Eminence Bishop Oxentius, I ask for your holy blessing. Winter has now set in, bringing with it its own array of cares and concerns, but also bringing a calm, peaceful atmosphere of prayer and seclusion from the outside world. It is the long dark nights in winter that cause me to reminisce over the past 30 years of my life which I have spent here, in this little convent. The bell that Archbishop Yosef brought here almost 90 years ago is still being rung. 
summoning the faithful to prayer. I've been here, the uh, rector of this parish for well, 31 years now. We came in 1991, so yeah, 31 years. I was ordained by Metropolitan Vitaly Ustinov. When we first came here in uh, 1991, uh, with my wife and um, our daughter, Anna, um, we came here, there was, uh, I thought there was another priest serving in the, in the parish here at, at St. Vladimir's. There was no other priest. I served liturgy here, and then it was close to the Feast of Protection of the Mother of God, and I was asked to serve at the convent in Bluffton. I was told there's a small, a small parish uh, was there. No one was living there except Terenti, the old caretaker. I remember Terenti, the caretaker, lamenting and apologizing to me because we, we stayed at the, in what's called the priest house. It was empty. There was nothing there, not even a stove. Like they took everything out of there. They even took the old lawnmower. The entire place was emptied. Even the church was stripped of all liturgical items. I had to bring everything to be able to serve. After we were there, we, I even asked Metropolitan, I said, um, you know, your eminence, I'm still basically packed up from, from, from our move from New York. And there's actually more people in the Bluffton area that I discovered that who don't have a priest. There's nothing here in Edmonton. There was actually only six people when I first came. And so I said, well, let me live at the convent, you know, or, or Dormish um, Protection Convent. Because at that point, it wasn't functioning as anything. So um, I mentioned that to his eminence, and he said, no, 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 Father Andrew. He says, he says just be patient. He says, I, I have a plan. So what that plan was, um, again, for myself to be where I am, that's where he put me, but to revive St. Vladimir's parish, because it was shut down for a number of years. He said he's, he's relighting the Lampada of prayer, that he's looking for sisters to, to populate the convent. All the abbesses were afraid when Metropolitan was showing up because he knew he was on the hunt looking for nuns, you know, looking for, it's like, you know, keep, keep our sisters away from Metropolitan, you know, <laughs> right? So word got out and so he did collect um, a few sisters. Of course, um, the present uh, Mother Ambrosia and her mother. I so vividly remember my first winters here in Alberta alone with my mother. I must confess that I was often oppressed by the haunting thoughts. Will we be able to pull through here? Will new sisters ever join us? Or will my mother die overtaken by years and leave me to grow old here all alone? Will I go to my grave leaving this sacred place abandoned? I came the 1st of June, 1993. Metropolitan came in July of that same year, in a month or so. And we discussed things, what he wished and what I wished, and, and everything we agreed upon, that this convent be established. And I saw what shape everything was in. Like, it actually, many said, this place should have been condemned. It was in such poor shape. And it was very lonely. We didn't have much help, hope or help actually. I'd walk around in the fields in the back and think, is it really true that nobody's going to come and my mother will pass away? I'll be alone here like St. Herman of Alaska. But no, in the beginning of 1995, my first novice came, Mother Paisia.
I came for a visit for the feast in October of 1994 for five days and the Metropolitan blessed me to to enter the convent and Mother Ambrosia blessed me to enter the convent. So I went back home and settled my affairs and came back in March 1995. And I've been here ever since. And that time it was just Mother Ambrosia and her mother, um, nun Theodora. Well, I already knew that I wanted to be a nun. I had to be a nun someplace. There was no two ways about it. There was, I just couldn't live in the world anymore. Just something about the place, I guess because it's so quiet, it's out in the country. I, was, I grew up out in the country. I'm used to being out. Um, I, I don't like cities. I don't like even like towns having people, strangers around. I just felt that this was home. This is where I wanted to be. I think what's dearest to me is when somebody's tonsured. The grace that fills the convent is unbelievable. The temptations and the hardships before are also unbelievable. But once it's done, it's sort of like a feeling of eternity. I think those are my favorite moments when the sisters have given their vows and they're tonsured. Well, when His Eminence comes, I'm always happy. That's very special when special clergy comes. We gather around and ask them questions and, you know, for guidance and help. That for us is very, very special. We all feel so blessed. Please keep us, our little convent, in your holy prayers, your eminence, and ask, ask our, our Lord, Lord to, to grant, grant that we may always be in this holy place, fulfilling our monastic vows, and that people of all ages may continue to come here and find a grace-filled place where they can pray and grow in faith, hope, patience, forgiveness, and love. Mother Ambrosia is the abbess of the convent of the protection in Lufton, and that convent itself is under my Episcopal oversight, so I am her ruling bishop. The chapel that he constructed there, I must say, is, as much as one can draw inferences about somebody from the work of their hands, is, is lovingly constructed and has an atmosphere of prayer. That's a very hard thing to to quantify or to qualify to explain to somebody, but you just have the sense when you step in that chapel that it's been, that it's seen vigils, it's seen, you know, dark winter hours of prayer and gathering and faithful with earnest entreaties and supplications and love for their, their, their creator and savior, um, chanted uh, piously and, uh, and at length, many, many hours. I would say must have been a very spiritual man. Archbishop Yasaf means a lot to me. He means a lot to all of us. First of all, I think because he prays for us. And because as poor as we are, we try to live up to his example. We try to fulfill what he wanted here. What his dream was to have a monastery here. To keep the prayers going. Archbishop Yosef was born in 1888. His father was a village priest. He lost his mother. She passed away when he was six years old. At the age of 10, his father brought him to the famous town of Tikvin, where he venerated the miraculous icon of the Mother of God. And it was there that he completed his preparatory classes for the seminary. Archbishop Yosef's friend wrote to him, uh, this land is very reminiscent of the homeland, and it's in great need of a pastor. So will you come? And he answered, I will come. 
even though he was very, very aware of the hardships that he would face here. So in 1930, he settled in Montreal and began the process of building churches. He came basically penniless, but with God's help, he managed to build 40 parishes and three monastic communities, this being the only monastic community that is still in existence, that is still active, that hasn't been forgotten about. If someone were to ask me who I am, I would tell them that I'm, I'm a nun. I've dedicated my life to God, um, to service to our church, to our sisterhood, and it's a lifelong commitment. And it's every day, it's every, every moment, we don't stop. It's not like um, we live a different life, it's our continuous life. I would not be afraid of ten thousands of people that set themselves against me round about. Arise, O oh Lord, save me, O oh my God. One of the main duties of a nun is to pray. Pray for themselves, pray for their family, pray for their friends, for their enemies, for the whole world. Also to try to show kindness and love to other people. And to forget about ourselves and try to work towards something greater. To try to work towards the good of the convent. It's clearly a calling. It's not simply a, as it were, a rational choice. The Lord says that to not everyone is it given to follow this path. And St. Paul also talks about it being um, a difficult cross to take up and that not everybody can do uh, to live the virginal life. You need a certain strength for this. You need a certain love from God in your heart of the monastic, of the, of the virginal life. To quote St. Paul, to always, to, to be able to live with the thought of always pleasing the Lord as opposed to a spouse, a family, and so on. And for that matter, to uh, have patience for the, the practical cares that, that are so uh, often so heavy in worldly life. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Amen. Thanks for the bread, Father. You're, you're welcome. What kind is it to be? It's one half whole wheat. Only two more loaves of white for tomorrow. May, may, may be blessed. <laughs> Father Denise, you mix our bread and you serve it at the convent. We're really grateful for fresh bread. Winter has now set in, bringing with it its own array of cares and concerns, but also bringing a calm, peaceful atmosphere of prayer and seclusion from the outside world. I do appreciate King God for that I have to think about food because um, you can more easily pray and disobedience, um, especially washing dishes. Mm -hmm. very, I'm very grateful for these obedience because it allows for more 
Spiritual life is my favorite thing. Reading about the Holy Fathers and how they lived and, and wishing to be like, hopefully I could be like that a little bit. <laughs> Being guided by Abbas and Rosie, who's a, a very, very high spiritual life, Abbas. And she really helps me with every problem I have about my own life that needs to be changed. I really am grateful to her for that. <laughs> this is the west side of the house. Mm -hmm. Right at this time we have the icon screen here. And then the new addition is built onto it. I'm surprised. I think these photographs have gotten dark with time. We found many, many wasp nests like this Oof. all over the place. <laughs> Everywhere, on every wall, in every corner. <laughs> Mm. But we were still working it. We did all the flooring, the walls ourselves, the painting, the insulation. I had to wear those ear things. It was so noisy with all the sawing and drilling. And Is that everything. you? That's me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is when I just came. Metropolitan Vitali, mm -hmm. Father Bartholomew, who later was a bishop. Mother Theodora, my biological mother. We went to the convent together, that's me. And then there was a young novice, Sister Lydia. Mm -hmm. later went into iconography. First week of Great Lent in 1993, and all of a sudden I get a phone call. Mother, would you like me to come and paint the dining room? Oh, I was so happy because it was so dark. <laughs> what color? I said, light yellow with white. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, it's shady here, but you can see how everything... Yeah, and the ceiling was just as dark as that orange. It used to be orange. It just mm -hmm. doesn't show up. Now it's white and... Right. There's Christmas. Oh, this is what you were talking about yeah. with the Christmas tree right yeah. here. Our first Christmas tree was, I just cut a few branches, put them in a vase. Oh. We didn't have, I bought a few little trinkets and put them on. And there's my mother with Monica. Mm -hmm. And you can see the ceiling, it's like you saw, lumpy. Yeah. That was her room after she passed away. This is my mother's grave here. Um, she was born in 1912 and lived through the revolution in the Ukraine, in Kiev, and the artificial famine, and landed up in Germany, where she met Metropolitan Vitali. He helped very many immigrants, thousands of them. So my mother, from six year old, she wanted to become a nun, but then the revolution happened in Ukraine. The communists came in um, 1918. So when I made the decision, I more or less wanted to become a nun at the age of 16, but because of various reasons, I was only able to fulfill my desire. Uh, at about the age of 38 or so, I went to Australia together with my mother, and she was very happy to be able to enter the convent together with me. So we became novices there for four and a half years, and Rasa four nuns, and then came here where I was tonsured by Metropolitan Vitali to the little schema, and she was likewise. And then right before her death, she was tonsured to the great schema. Here is buried Mother Varsinopia. She was the secretary for the Western Diocese of Canada for Metropolitan Vitali. She helped him very much. She helped this convent very much. The older nuns that lived here before us, they lived here between 1950 and 1990. And here is Father Leonid Pies. He was in concentration camps in Russia, up north, as was Father Yasaf there in the deep snow. And this monument here is Bishop Saba. He was very educated theologically, and he was a world judge before that, but he had to retire right away because he had to, um, it was a case that he had to give the death sentence, and he couldn't do it, so he retired. There's a lot of older ones there too. There's, there's Father Asaf that I mentioned. His legs were broken. And many pioneers, Russians and Ukrainians started coming over at the end of the 19th century for lands. Because, well, they were promised lands here for free. Mm. And it was, it was a good bargain. 
I knew at least 90% of the people that are buried in the cemetery. So this place personally to me means a lot. This life is temporary. Everybody wants to live as long as possible. That's because we're supposed to live eternally. We were made that way in paradise. But because of the fall and other, you know, in paradise, we lost it. And that's why everyone desires to live longer. And for me, this is like an inn, a place where we stop off temporarily to work out our life, our salvation, show where we stand in relation to God, and that determines our future there. And that's eternal. So this is a place of pain, illness, ending with death. Of course, God gives us joy and plenty of it, but then sorrow, grief, etc. So we shouldn't be afraid of death if our conscience is clear. And if we have faith, there's no such thing as death. That's birth to go into the other world. They were putting in so many windows, I must, I don't know, it must be 30 of them or more in there. Yeah, so I was helping her and then all of a sudden my back went out here, the leg, and all I could do was stand and step and say, that window goes there, that window goes there. Uh, it was something else, you know. So we, we contacted, we helped them build that, the big church, the new one, eh? Yeah, that was quite a job. Went there as kids. Our moms would uh, would uh, take us there, and we'd, we'd be there for for a whole week. They had cattle there, they had pigs. And the kids loved it. We go out there and help. Uh, one time there, and there's the goats, and the, and the nuns go, and the goats do like the nuns because they're used to them. But when I went in there, the, nuns, the goats would attack me. So I... <laughs> now the convents, I guess, always been around since I've. I've been around, you know, my family all went there for the feast days and uh, like my grandparents and, and my parents tried to help out a lot um, during all the renovations that occurred there. We have our feast days, they come visit us. And it's always great when you see the nuns come in, you know, you know, even though, you know, they're, they're all in black and all that, but it just, uh, you know that these are the, the people that pray for us all the time and, and then we should be praying for them also. A lot of times we felt very isolated here. So growing up, you know, I grew up feeling very isolated, even in our church. Um, and it's not necessarily a small church, but I felt isolated. And, and having a convent, having other things around us really made it feel more like a community, I think. I've been going to the convent for about 15 years of my life. And uh, I always felt that place was very special to me, very important, very welcoming. And now that I've grown up, um, I go there pretty often to help with things. My friends and I would sometimes come out in the summertime and visit, and I think that it has a big impact getting to, to see firsthand um, what monastic life looks like. If you're not exposed to that as you're growing up, it just seems like a very foreign type of lifestyle. I was able to become very comfortable around them and um, not be not be intimidated by, by coming here. Yeah, and your name is? Lady 
Yes, I think I talked mm -hmm. to you on the phone in regards to the tourism book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. When can we make arrangements to do that? In the summertime, like in the springtime? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. We're not. We're not going anywhere in the winter. But you guys look lovely dressed and warm, so that'd be great. Hi, guys. We see them on a regular basis and the people that come in here know that they're around most of them so um, I don't know if they get the same reaction at co-op like I think that's where you'll see because so many outsiders go to the bigger grocery store in town or whatever mm -hmm. but here they're well known I didn't really react anything different. Um, I have a lovely Mennonite girl working for me. We have religion everywhere. We have about 18 churches in our area. So there's every section you can think of. These two are the, well, I'm gonna say they're the ones that often have to come get the stuff. <laughs> so they're always the ones calling for answers, but they're the most that I deal with. So yeah. There are big helpers, right? Yes, I'm not used to that, but yes, instead of a check. <laughs> My parents are converts to Orthodoxy. And so when we were small, they used to take us, there was a, a small monastic community uh, about a three hour drive away from our home that they would take us to in terms of trying to put it forward that that was always a possibility, mm -hmm. that monasticism did exist. And it was some, it was a direction to look in. So that's, it was actually there that I decided I wanted to become a nun. Mm. How old are you? When I decided, mm -hmm. I was five. Wow. Yeah. The absolute highest, you can say, example of, 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 of women is the mother of God. And she was extremely humble and extremely loving strive to follow in her steps. Uh, okay, there's seven nuns. I think at this point I've had a conversation with all of them, I think. Why did I come here? Uh, I came here for, I wanted a spiritual retreat, so I thought the convent is really the best place to go. That's, that's Sister Seraphima. Um, she takes care of the animals and many other things besides that. But they're quite hysterically fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See how close it is? Whoa. <coughs> there you go. <laughs> and my he uh, told me, now that you're the only milk here, you don't have a lesson to get sick. <laughs> yeah, and I know. I didn't. I didn't get sick for four years, a single time. After she said that? After she said that. Wow. Until, until Mother Bessie said she decided, no, she should start helping us too because we have more goats now. Uh -huh. Then I started getting sick again because oh, there was yeah. a Did you replacement. Get the no, yeah, you got a lesson to do. Exactly. 
I definitely want to return, and I would recommend any young or older Orthodox Christian woman or even men can take pilgrimages here too. I think they would really get something out of it because I, I have. Things wouldn't be good from a Christian perspective if, for some reason, monasticism, you know, disappeared off the face of the earth and people just just lived, you know, more conventional lives, didn't feel this calling. People that commit themselves in body and soul to the religious life uh, daily and 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 persist in their prayers not only just for their own souls but as much for the souls of others. Out of, out of genuine Christian love. I also do think in a certain way that women are more easily called to monastic life. Their innate sense of care, compassion, patience with the needs of others, so well exemplified in, in childbearing, serves very well in spiritual life. We have to it's not all about ambition. It's 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 about it's about the willing to be uh, sacrificial in one's behavior, to be very patient with complaints, difficulties, frustrations, tribulations, uh, to be compassionate towards all, uh, irrespective of whether they seem to appreciate that, to deserve that, to to invite that. Um, a mother's love is, is well known and, and rightly credited universally with being nearly unsurpassed. Hi, I just want to thank you for a little present in honor of your 30th, 34th anniversary as a past monastic. Thank you so much. Oh, that is it's also the anniversary of Mother Theodora's entry into the heavenly convent. That's right. We entered the earthly convent together and got to her on the same day. Forgive me for my insufficiencies and at times maybe abruptness. Yeah, forgive me. Thank but you know so. that's only because I care. Even when I'm strict, that shows I love them. Otherwise, I wouldn't bother with them. <laughs> We're all here together, literally a sisterhood in Christ. Yeah. I firmly believe an abbess or an abbot has to lay down their life for their brothers or sisters, if it gets down to it. Just like you see in the wild, animals do that. The birds, how they protect their little ones.
Archbishop Yasaf's wishes and dreams come through. He obtained this land, he started a brotherhood, then there was another sisterhood, and then us, and his wish that there always be monastics here. That's why in 1950, when he gifted it to the, the abbess of the convent in San Francisco, he did it specifically because he was being transferred, that this land not be adopt, uh, abandoned, but that the monastic life continue here. And that's my wish that it continue, God willing, with my sisters after me and new ones who love God and wish to give their life to God and their neighbor in this holy way of life. In monasticism, we do not have work. We call it obedience. It's a whole disposition of how you perform your work. Obediently, not forced, but with love. You can't have true obedience without love. Otherwise, you're slaves. So that's my desire that this place remain faithful to his wishes, that they live with the fear of God and love. Please keep us, our little convent, in your holy prayers, Your Eminence, and ask our Lord to grant that we may always be in this holy place, fulfilling our monastic vows, and that people of all ages may continue to come here and find a grace-filled place where they can pray and grow in faith, hope, patience, forgiveness, and love. With much love in Christ, Abbas Ambrosia. It's a very dear place for us. Um, it holds a special place in our hearts. They do so much, you know, in their yards and they keep it beautiful. It's a beautiful place to come and, and visit. It's very serene. Our children, we had four girls and they would go to the convent and they'd, they'd, they'd play around the yard and they got along real good with the, with the nuns. The convent for me has quite literally changed my life. They're a huge joy in my life. Very big blessing, and anytime I go back home to Canada, I always have to visit Mapushka and all the nuns. It's such a beautiful place to visit for many people, and it's got a, it's got a real soft spot in my heart um, for everyone there. We're supported by the prayers of our beloved nuns on a daily basis, and we need them to continue to be a part of our journey. We really come over here because the friendship is great, and it's the serenity. Whenever you feel uptight, you can come over here and I can talk to all the sisters. The convent is such a special place and Mother Ambrosia and the entire sisterhood are wonderful people. May we always have their prayers. You know, when you go, they would greet you with so much love and, and piety and compassion and understanding and listening. And you know, when you were there, you were like transported to this other peaceful place.